You're still on The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Ezekiel Yai took joins us all the way from Akwaibom State. Uh, it's good to have you join us this morning. Otuwekong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Always my pleasure. Nice to be with you again. All right, then. Uh, let's start off with the leadership newspaper. Uh, this morning, fantastic headlines. Uh, very interesting. Muslim, Muslim ticket. You have nothing to fear. APC assures Christians. Uh, that's the bold caption on the leadership. Underneath, it's an act of God. Adamu is quoted. Ignore religion, vote competence, Akeri Dolu tells Nigerians. Tunubu's wife will be unofficial Christian vice president, says Masari. And away from that, Uzodemaz, 783 I take that again. Uzo Demas, 783, $804 million wristwatch can build state-of-the-art hospital and roads. And price adjustment will end fuel scarcity. What marketers are saying amid the fuel crisis. United Kingdom, Nigeria, Bond, Kemi Badnock, among top six contenders for Boris Johnson's job and, uh, you know, there's also that video that was viral yesterday where she was talking about uh, why she wants to become uh, prime minister and what's her inspiration, which also some people said, you know, she threw shades on Nigeria. IGP bans use of spy number plates nationwide. Please arrest fleeing Kujay prison SKP in Ogun. Atiku, PDP governors for Oshun mega rally today. And uh, the right is on or the caption this morning on the leadership. But we turn our attention from the leadership. That's because we have the nation newspaper this morning. Governors are saying Muslim, Muslim ticket not against Christians. Akira Dolu Ganduje Masari dismisses fear as unfounded. Adamu, nothing worry about, apparently. Uh, there's a right there underneath that caption. And Oshun 2022, Oyetola Adeleke order signed peace accord. Peter Obi campaigners uh, or campaigns for Lasson in Oshogbo and Islamic groups, ex students back Ogun BA. Uh, another one talks about. 448 jostling for 28 governorship seats. COVID-19 cases sharply in July. Uh, Buhari, I'm leaving no inheritance for my children. Again, 165 Naira petrol pump price. No longer realistic, says marketers. You fix lecturers' wages on unilaterally, government tells ASU. And uh, uh, the caption you find this morning on The Nation. And let's look at the Daily Independent away from The Nation. 165 Naira petrol pump price. Unsustainable marketers insist. Uh, the marketers might just be dominating uh, the papers this morning with their concern about the pump price. Says there's need for gradual subsidy reduction to end fuel crisis. And how can these things be? Are you Atiku PDP Governor Tom Oshun holds mega rally for a delegate today? And some people call him the dancing senator. Insecurity, IGP bans use of spy number plates nationwide. Buhari tax youths to educate themselves to overcome poverty. Says he's not leaving any asset for his children. Another Kujay prison SKP arrested in Ogun. An MPC commences trial census with Buhari participating in Daura. Appeal courts did not order sub licensing of channels to firm. A multi choice uh, lawyer quoted on that. AAC and NPP yet to nominate candidates for uh, the 2023 state elections. This is according to INEC. 13 states signed peace accord ahead of the July 16th Oshun Guba poll. And a lot of people have queried what significance is this peace accord because usually, I mean, 
it doesn't always uh, translate to having these parties in peace. Windstorm kills six in Jigawa and flood claims seven in Lagos. Very, very sad. But that's it this morning on the Daily Independent. And we'll just quickly run through the punch before we have Ezekiel Nyai to share his thoughts this morning on uh, the big stories. Muslim Muslim Tika's decision on Shatima final says Tunubu's men downplay aggrieved members' defections. Uh, Compliance over Muslim running mate, ex Lagos governor won't recede his decision to please critics, says Adeye. Those not pleased can vote for Obi Atiku orders. Adeboye Adebayo uh, is quoted. Uh, you also find another inflation dates and debts pushing Nigeria orders to brick. Inflation and debts pushing Nigerians orders to brick IMF is quoted. And banks borrow 595 Point three four billion naira from Central Bank of Nigeria in two months. Directors lobby ahead of screening for the AGF job. And terrorists killed 14,500 and 5.5 million displaced, according to ECOWAS. And another one says, uh, Arag Bashola's faction banks on court to sack Oyetola. Oyetola Adeleke orders signed the peace pact ahead of the elections and we didn't uh, pass Sharia law, says Lagos Assembly. Um, Amotaku arrest 120 Dodge's question on Owo massacre. Well, this is some of the interesting headlines on uh, the Punch newspaper this morning. Federal government meets Ipman and more men fuel to costs more. Uh, the headlines this morning on uh, the Punch newspaper. Ezekiel Yaitok joins us. Thank you so much for being part of the show this morning. Thanks for having me as always. Uh, it's a delight. Well, let's head straight to it under leadership and all the papers. The Muslim Muslim ticket. You have nothing to fear. The EAPC assures Christians. Uh, let's not forget that just shortly after you have the APC uh, nominating or unveiling her running mate for uh, the uh, presidential post, of course, a vice presidential uh, position, uh, that has caused a lot of um, you know, reaction. A lot of persons have expressed their concerns, different stakeholders as regards the Muslim, Muslim tickets. But here you have the APC assuring Christians that there's really nothing to uh, be concerned about. Do you think that there's nothing to be concerned about? Um, I, I think that Nigerians, are, uh, they fail to understand what nationhood is. And they also fail to to go back to history and put things in the proper perspective. I want to tell you one, two, three things. When you just suppose where we are today and at the time of MK or Abiola, where he had um, a Muslim Muslim ticket with um, Alahaji, King Gibe, as at that time. A few things, parallels, uh, cannot be drawn. First is the nation that we are in. Today, Nigeria has not been this polarized and divided. If you look at the leadership of this country, probably out of the top 15, you can say that about, about 13 are all Muslims. And um, there's been a lot of cry about that, that um, our president has been very clannish and um, people are uh, talking of different agenda being, um, you know, uh, being pushed. And uh, that is on one hand. On second hand, if you look at the time where you talk about the Muslim, Muslim ticket, please, I need to be proved wrong if I am. The Senate president, as at that time, was a Christian. The Speaker of the House of Reps was a Christian. So when we had a Muslim, Muslim ticket, they were both Christians, and there wasn't any dissension, there wasn't any... You know, they were just fair-minded, carrying on without any division, whether you're a Muslim, you're a Christian. 
So when when MKO now picked um, you know um, King Gibe, the nation moved on because as at that time we were thinking in terms of competence, capacity, capability. There was nationhood. We're moving together in the same direction. It's a completely different thing from what is going on today in our country. So for you to now say that it doesn't matter is to be insensitive of, of, of the X factor in nationhood. Ordinarily, somebody like myself will tell you, look, give us the best, you know, to, to, to lead us, you know, uh, because that is what I believe in. That is what I understand. That is what makes sense to me. Because like, like, like leading a country is like driving a vehicle. No matter where you come from, whether you are tall or black or, or short, you are dark, you are male, female, which of those things is not as important as if you have the competencies to drive the vehicle. So ordinarily, that is where my position will be. But like I said, in governance, that's what you call the X factor. That X factor is what you cannot exactly define, but which will affect every single thing you do, the decision and everything. If we had been able to move the country in a direction where we think competence, capacity, which is the ultimate direction, but I couldn't care less if it was uh, the president's brother or even wife that was succeeding him, because we know that our focus is on getting the country to move in the right direction. But we have abused that X factor and used it negatively where religion, tribe, and all those um, other sentiments have, have overtaken the recruitment uh, re, uh, profiling uh, criteria. So to that extent, please don't tell me it doesn't matter because it matters. You can see what is going on in the Southeast about the IPOB. It's basically about, I want to be part of this country. I want to, no matter how much people misunderstand what is going on, the basic demand is, I want to be an equal partner in this country. So whatever it takes for you to animate that and give me the confidence that I'm an equal partner, no matter how you do it, then you solve that problem. But right now, there's so much cry that, Muslims are taking over everywhere. The Christians are like endangered species. If you go into our constitution, you don't see one word about church or Christian, God, but everything is replete. All these things have, 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 have moved the X factor in the direction of disunity, in the direction of lack of equity, in the direction of not having excellence as a basis for leadership recruitment. And so long as that X factor is in that direction, you've got to move it gradually back to the middle of neutrality, of excellence, and then you can take some of the decisions that they are trying to take now. That is my understanding and my position on that. Well, um, one of the things that have always stood out, I mean, we're at a time where we say that where we are, some people have attributed that to, uh, you know, lack of competence and where you say you don't have leaders that are, you know, have what it takes uh, to call the shots and, uh, you know, pilots uh, uh, the affairs of the nation, however you want to put it. But one thing that has stood out, this word has been, you know, moving around every other time is the word competence. And again, you also have ignore religion and vote competence. Uh, this is what the likes of Akira Dulu is telling Nigerians. Um, so does it really mean that I'm asking that yeah. there are no Christians that are competent, um, you know, within different geopolitical zones of the country. I'll, I'll tell you this. The very first thing is that in virtually every village, well, let me not exaggerate, in every state, definitely, you can find extremely competent people even within the 35, 45 age bracket. I can tell you that for a fact. I've been around this country. I've interacted with young people. Not to talk of if you open the vista to maybe say up to 60.
Well, we're hoping that we have a Zika on your eye to uh, join the conversation. Unfortunately, that disconnection happened. But uh, the question is whether do we have, uh, you know, competent persons? Because the issue here is, hey, the reason why we have a Muslim-Muslim ticket is that, you know, we're looking at competence. And so uh, you probably, if you look at religion, then you probably might not have um, uh, any person or candidate who's competent for that particular position. And some people say that this is very insensitive. It's actually a slap. Uh, but on the other hand, you also have the EPC saying this is nothing to worry about. This really nothing. But should we really ignore it? Because over time, we constantly say that, you know, religion and uh, tribe and uh, whatever should not actually be a factor in choosing or voting who becomes um, a governor or a president and what have you. The list is almost endless. But we see that we can ignore these things. This is our reality, that every other time, for every elections, that you have these factors res responsible. People would always, um, you know, tilt towards, uh, you know, religion. People would always tilt towards um, their geographical, uh, you know, their tribe, you want to say, or zone, different zones, and all of that. So um, why are we trying to forget about our current reality? And some persons have also would constantly make reference to uh, the 1993 elections where you had a Muslim-Muslim ticket. And the question is, what's different? And what's different is that uh, what happened in 1993 and what's happening right now, the Nigeria of 1993 and now are two different, almost two different countries. Because it feels like we're more divided than we should have been. We'll just take a quick break and uh, connect back with Ezekiel Nyaito. Please stay with us. What do you want me to do? When I analyze, some, some people in Akoba say that I'm giving my opinion about issues. Mm, I cannot now. For every time you talk, you know the yes people, they say, oh, you're not supposed to give your thoughts. It puts, it puts you, you know, in that space. I don't want to be there. Mm, oil marketers. What do you do? Price adjustments will end fuel scarcity. Price adjustment. Price adjustment. This is Messi. <laughs> She's your uncle. Hi. This Hi. is your producer, Osari. See? Hey. Osari. Osari, yes. How are you? Fine. Is it going to be back? Um, sir, please don't yes. Okay, yeah, that's true. Okay, so we're going back. Right. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Sorry. Sir, can you please unmute your microphone? Right? Am I correct? Down. Okay, he said something already. Yep. Saka, you, we, we want it to be. Saka, you move to your right a bit. You're perfect. Perfect. So we, we'll just. Um, whew. I still the breakfast and plus CV Africa. As a Konya, I took a still with us and we are still looking at the pages of an actual dailies on the leadership this morning. The oil major oil marketers association of Nigeria 
uh, a calling for commencement of gradual deregulation of the downstream oil and gas sector to reflect current price of petroleum products. Ezekiel, um, yeah. what do you make of this? I mean, it, it might just such, you know, some people say it's a difficult time for Nigerians. So we're talking about you know, I, deregulation now, subsidy, removal, you know, everything is just yeah. happening at the same time. We live in a country where certain figures, data statistics, seem to be mysteries. And government is run on data and statistics. You can't do planning, never, without proper data and statistics. You can't. And yet, this becomes one thing that we find it difficult to relate with. Let me give you a very simple illustration on this fuel issue. During um, President Jonathan's time, when we had this issue coming up with subsidy, no subsidy, one of the best first complications was our fuel consumption as a nation. They were talking about 35 million liters per day, and a panel was set up, and there was a very uh, sharp discrepancy. We said, no, we don't um, consume that much. We should be consuming something in the neighborhood of about 25 million liters. Take the, take the top figure, which was 35 million liters per day. During the course of this administration, we are running about sometimes 60. In fact, there was a particular month, I believe, that we had over a hundred million liters as against a disputed 35 million liters just a few months, a few years ago. And I ask myself, this is a time that businesses are shutting down on account of which industries, factories are not operating at maximum capacity. So apart from, you say they use diesel, but they have vehicles that they run. It's just commonsensical that you are not, if you're not running at top level, a lot of things are going to have to be scaled down. A lot of people are going to be retrenched. A lot of people are going to lose their job. Those people that are retrained and losing their job, likelihood is that they will not be making the amount of trips that they were making on a regular, on a daily basis. They are now going to, because of the money that they don't have, ration how they use their money to buy fuel and the price going up. And again, not going to work every day means that there are some days they may not be working. How on earth are we consuming the amount of the, uh, petrol that, let's be just zero it down to petrol that we are consuming on a daily basis. It doesn't make sense. Now, technology, if I were in charge of, look, if every bank, how many bank accounts do we have compared to petrol pump, petrol stations and the pumps? You can, by technology, monitor every single fuel dispense in every station in this country. It's because we have allowed this concept of corruption to become something that, you know, vested interests have held the, con held the country captive. That is why I'm looking at presidential candidates that are willing to say, if I perish, I perish. And Nigerians should forget this issue of APC, PDP, forget them. I'm starting to get certain sound bites, and please don't who uh, underestimate anybody. Don't dismiss anybody that can come up to the point of wanting to say, I want to be the president of this country. And it's not when they were doing primaries, when there were so many in a party. We are talking of 18 people. Before you can come to the point of having the flag of a registered party, you must be somebody that has something, you know, between your ears. To that extent, we should start to put these people on the line and ask them very hard questions. That is why I'm very proud of the candidate of ADC, Mr. Dubebi Kachiku. 
He is taking a minimum of three to five interviews on a daily basis. And I'm talking of hardcore interviews. And of recent, we started this thing that is novel in Nigerian politics. It's like set of the national address, which happens on two days back, running live on stations. Let these people come out and answer hard questions. Talk to us about ASU, what do you understand by it? Why do we have the problem? But, 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 what do you think would be I the mean, solution? At, at this point that we're in now, because you have this market as well saying that petrol should cannot, they can't sustain selling petrol at 165 naira per liter. And so there's need for um, you know, deregulation gradually. But this is not the first time the concept or the idea of deregulation has been mentioned in our polity. And so we've been dwindling uh, deregulation. Um, now we're saying oh, we're subsidy and no subsidy. And the government is saying that we can't sustain subsidy because that's what it's looking like. And people have said, you know, it's, it's so much that we're spending subsidizing petrol. But all of this is happening okay. at a time where you have, um, you know, the inflation rate at a double digit. And that has been consecutive for almost eight years. It's a time where you have you know, so much instability. And the other option is that businesses would crumble. And what if businesses crumble, then what becomes of the economy? Because we're trying to sustain the economy, but these businesses are the life wire of the economy. I don't understand. You see, a lot of times we pursue a narrative that is being given to us. And those narratives are roads that lead to nowhere. I have only, let me give a very simple hypothetical situation. I can only afford 20 million to subsidize because of the amount of money I have when you do the analytics of your budget. I can only afford 20 million. But the subsidy is asking me to bring 50 million. And I don't have 50 million, I only have 20. That is one argument, what I have and what I can afford. Honestly and sincerely, put that on one basket. Second basket, I am an importer or a marketer. I buy this product and total cost to me without overhead is five naira. I cannot sell it for four naira, except you are subsidizing me. That is another fact that you cannot dispute in a different basket. There is a third basket that we must interrogate as a nation. What is that third basket? The quantity that I should subsidize. If we look at the honest quantity and multiply by the subsidy coefficient relative to the amount of money I have, you may discover that I don't need 20 million that I already have and could budget, but 12.5 million, in which case I can either conveniently subsidize it or I can even say, well, I already have this 20 million, so you can reduce the price for my people, let me subsidize it some more. So the elephant in the room is the quantity which you will have to multiply by the differential to know whether it is what you can afford or what you cannot afford. The problem is in the quantity. I can't tell marketers to buy something for five naira and sell it for four naira, it doesn't make sense. On the other hand, I can't tell government to subsidize 50 million when they only have 20 million. Honestly and sincerely, it doesn't make sense. It is when you have looked at this third factor and discovered that, yes, we are actually consuming 100 million liters. And we don't have that 50 million that you can come to have a conversation with Nigerians with an open template and say, Nigerians, this is the amount of money we have. This is the amount of money you are consuming. Can you play down on the consumption pattern or can you pay a little bit more? Nigerians are not unreasonable, they will follow. But today, we are playing the ostrich. Nigerians know that subsidy is a fraud, which is where Mr. President started from. He said subsidy is a fraud before he gets into government. 
Why is he suddenly saying that it is no longer a fraud? Why is he saying that when 35 million was an inflated figure, that 60 something million or even 100 million would be an accepted figure? Where are the dynamics coming from, the data and statistics? Something is wrong. Well, is and it fundamentally so. Well, Ezekiel uh, we we have to go now at this point. I, I mean, I was hoping that we could, you know, talk more. Uh, something is really wrong, and we're hoping that it gets fixed because Nigerians will be the one bearing the brunt at the end of the day. Uh, quite unfortunate. We'll also hear that banks are borrowing so much from the central bank, and the question is why are banks borrowing? I mean, you have... It, it doesn't really add up. But that's it. Thank you so much, Ezekiel Yaitouk, for being part of The Breakfast. What a pleasure. Thank you. Ezekiel Yaitouk is uh, a public affairs analyst. He's also vying for, uh, you know, governorship position right in Aquabum State. Uh, always a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you so much and have a great day. And that's the size of it on Off the Press. We take a break. But just before that break, let's tell you what happened today in history. Stay with us.